Okay. Good to go. You ready? Yep. Going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. And today we are making a joinery window. I know, haven't you made one of those before? Yes, I've actually made two of them before. Uh, it's one I try and do once every two years and it makes a really good one for the live because it's a great chance to practice your skills and see how you have improved over the years. So this was the one I made four years ago. This is the one we made two years ago. And so we're gonna be going through it again and seeing how they come up. Uh, and it's kind of fun to actually take a closer look at these and see that my camera's not on. <laughs> to see some of the, the changes over the years and how things have adjusted. Um, so like on, on this one, whoop, wrong button, have really big gap on that miter joint. Uh, because one of the fun things about this particular one is you can make any one joint really, really well. But when they all come together, you often have issues with one running into the other. And so this is six sticks of wood. And with these six sticks of wood, there are nine joints, each one being very different. So we've got the half lap joint. Uh, we have, let's go into the next one. We have the next one is the bridle joint. Uh, then we have the bridled miter joint. Then we have the, uh, the keyed miter joint. Um, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Splined miter joint. Inside, we've got the ending dovetail. We've got a um, drawboard mortise and tenon. We've got a standard mortise and tenon. And then we've got the pocket screw as well as the through half lap in the middle. So it's a good way to try a bunch of things and see how they come out. Um, if you would like to build along with us, um, I am providing, I have right now, I have a free SketchUp file. Um, there's a link in the description as well as pinned in the comments. Um, not comments, the, the live chat. Um, and so if you want to download that and follow along, all you need are six pieces of wood that are, at, <clears throat> excuse me, that are longer than three times their width. Uh, mine are two and a half inches uh, by three quarter by one foot long. And that will give me, uh, this will be one of my, my smallest windows. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to playing with that one. Um, yeah. Oh, we do need to do um, upcoming things. So I was going to June fourteenth, fourteenth <laughs> uh, through the sixteenth, I'm going to be in Green Bay, Wisconsin, at the MWTCA National Meet. Uh, July sixteenth, I'm hoping um, it still isn't set up yet, but I'm hoping to be in Washington D.C. or outside of Washington D.C. for uh, the Potomac Tool Collectors Association, um, the um, PETA, not not PETA, um, PEC, no. Patina, there it is. <laughs> Your paper picked a peck. <laughs> Patina. Um, I haven't been able to go out to one of theirs, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, the big one, if you can go to any one meet this year, is Handworks. It is September 1st through the 2nd, and this is in Amana, Iowa. It is huge. It's an entire town devoted to hand tools for two days, and everyone's going to be there. Uh, all of the big names um, from, uh, um, I, okay, I don't think Paul Sellers is going to make it. Um, but you're going to see like Roy Underhill, uh, Rex and I are going to be doing a, a group meet. Um, Shannon Rogers, um, um, let's see, Anne, Anne of All Trades said she was, she was probably going to make it. Um, but then you will also see every tool maker that makes tools will be there. Um, from you know, Benchcrafted to um, Veritas and Lee Nielsen and everyone will have a booth that you can play with the tools. You can buy them if you want as well as there will be a few antique sellers. There are several barns set aside for demonstrations and hands-on uh, where you can play with things. Just an incredible uh, two-day event for hand tools. Um, so that'll be September 1st through 2nd in Amana, Iowa. Um, handworks.co. It's free to go to. Um, it's just if you sign up, you can be entered for door prizes. Uh, let's see. Next, I have September 16th. Maybe, I'm hoping this one as well, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, there's MWTCA meet out there. I've never been to it. I really want to go to. Um, that one's still up in the air, but we'll see. Uh, and then the last one I have right now is September 28th through the 30th in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, is the second MWTCA national meet. Um, so lots of fun things coming up this year. Um, yeah, let's get to this. So um, a half lap joint. What right, is back up for a whoop, second? Dennis Miko wants to know is Handworks on Labor Day weekend? I didn't hear the date. Uh, it is September first and second. That's I don't know what Labor Day weekend is this year. I can tell you one second. Um, it's yeah, I don't know. 
<laughs> so let me show. It's the Friday and Saturday before Labor Day. Oh. So then, yes. Um, a half lap joint is a joint that half of it laps one side and half of it laps the other side. Uh, it looks like a butt joint from the outside, but it is um, surprisingly strong for what it has. I mean, it is relying on the glue itself, but it's got registering faces, so it is stopped in two directions of movement. Uh, it is a joint that a lot of people kind of poo-poo because it is very simple, but it is a basic joint that you can then transfer the knowledge of making that into a lot of other things because all the tenon is is a double half lap joint. Um, you just have to make two halves of the same half. Um, so that's what we are making tonight. Um, one of the first things you're going to do on this one is you get your six pieces out and you're going to need to figure out which one of them goes where. For the first one, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to get two pieces and I'm going to do like that. After that, I need to keep track of which one goes with which one so that I don't accidentally flip one and then have two halves of the joints at different points in the joinery. Um, so it is very nice to label them all, which I will be doing after um, making the first one. I could go ahead and label them all at the beginning, but at this point, it really doesn't matter. Um, when it comes to joinery, the most important thing is finding where your marking knife went. Oh, I was using that earlier. <laughs> there it is. Um, this one is actually uh, kind of a fun one. I got this in the mail from uh, uh, Lake Erie Toolworks. And uh, for those of you who are tool nerds, focus. This one is just really, really cool. So I'm going to be playing with this um, and seeing if I like it. But yeah, Lake Erie Toolworks is now making those kind of fun monkey marking knives. I've got a lot of marking knives, but yeah. Um, so, oh. Sorry if I'm a little scatterbrained tonight. I don't know why, but I'm like really, woo, almost like I had too much caffeine, except for I haven't had any caffeine today. I didn't even have coffee this morning. Maybe that's the problem. I don't have any coffee, caffeine. Of course, caffeine's never really affected me that much, so. <laughs> so I can't do... see my face tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, everyone. Thinking. You can't see Sergey. For some reason, right before we went live, I realized that there's a problem with her camera, and uh, it's not wanting to work. I can make all the faces I want at you today. The fun of lives. So, um, what we need to do is both halves of the half lap joint are ex exactly identical, except for one of the boards rotates. So, whatever we do to one, we're going to do to the other. And what we need to do is put a mark in however far into the board this is, because this is going to go in, so we need to mark in the distance that this is in. So, what I could do is I could measure this and set my marking gauge to it and bring my marking gauge in here. But anytime you go from one to another, you end up um, losing some information. So in this case, I'm just going to put this on here. I'm going to flush it up with my end on the thumb. Make sure it feels really nice and flush. I'm going to put the marking knife in here. I'm just going to stab it in. I'm not going to move it around much. Just stab it in. And then bring this over and put it right back into that same hole. And with this in place, I'm going to go light, medium, hard. And with that on there, I'm actually going to bring it around and I want it to come down the face halfway. I'm going to put it right into that mark, slide the square up against it, come halfway down this face, roll it over and do the same thing on this side. And the cool thing about a half lap joint is you don't have to worry about tails and pins and one side being different from the other. They're both exactly the same. So whatever I've done to this one, now we need to do this one. So we're going to take this whole thing, flip it over, and just like that we've got the exact same thing we have on here. And one of the things I like about doing this particular joint first is I'll often have a lot of questions up front. So if anyone has any questions while I'm doing this, because this is such a simple joint, I will have a little more time tonight than I will for others. Are yes, I so do far? have a question. Okay, right, what do we got? Um, Nels, Noel Snaggle asks, is there an end-to-end -end joint that's good for compression? End-to-end -end joint. Um, are you talking like boards that way, and then compression this way? Um, or are you talking something stop that way or this way? Um, and we'd have to be a little bit more specific than that, sorry. Um, because usually if, if I'm putting boards together this way, first thing that comes to mind is tongue and groove joint. But, uh, oh, end to end, like that. Um, joining boards this way is actually very difficult. 
um, because they're, you're, you're putting end grain to end grain and glue does not like to work end grain to end grain. It will, but not as well. Um, and you have a lot of other problems. So then you start getting into, in, in, in standard Western traditions, there aren't a lot of reasons to do that. We end up working around other things or we'll buttress another piece in here. We'll put these two pieces and we'll sandwich another piece on either side of it. Um, in Jap Japanese joinery, they do a lot of really cool joints to go back to past, past each other. Uh, but in general, the half lap joint is what you want. Rather than being like this, you just rotate it and you have a half lap joint. Um, and so that's a good use for it. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Where'd my mark go? It's not on that board. Let's see, where am I at? Here we go. Is there another question? Um, not necessarily related to the topic, but yes. Okay, what's that? Uh, Dr. Khan asked, I just won a 71 and a half yesterday. Who makes compatible irons other than Veritas? For a seven and a half? I, well, typed in 71 and a half. I don't know if it's a typo or I don't know which plane that is. I don't know what the 71 and a half is. Dr. Khan, we need clarification. Let me know. <laughs> so now that we have our joint, we have our mark on this face and this face and this face. Now we need to put it down this way. And we want this mark to be exactly halfway down the face. We want it to be the same thing on both of them. So what I like to do is put the marking gauge in here and it looks like that's about half. I'm just going to eyeball it. And we'll Push the pin in a little ways, make a dimple, and then rotate it around, and I'm going to see if the pin fits into it. And in this case, it doesn't. So let me zoom in a little bit more. And we have a super chat when you have We them. do. Let me just finish this up. I don't think you guys can see those two dimples. Well, maybe you can. So we got two dimples there, and now what I want is I want to put this pin right in between those two. It's much easier to see that middle. So when I turn around this time, it should be right into that same mark. We should move it just a hair more. Not much, just a tiny, tiny bit. Tiny, tiny bit more. <laughs> when in doubt, hit it harder. Okay, there. So now I've got it centered on either side. And I know that this is my reference face on this one. And this is my... Oops, did that wrong. This is my reference face on this one, and this is my reference face on this one, which I should have a piece of tape on there. Um, I could put the little curly Q mark on there, but in this case, I'm gonna be marking them all with tape, and so usually I put the tape on whichever face is my reference face. Um, that one and that one. So I need this to be on here, and I'm gonna run all the way around these three sides. So what's the super chat? Idle Hands Workshop said, if nothing sticks to Teflon, how does Teflon stick to the pan? That's a good question. Maybe the Band question shouldn't be what doesn't it stick to, but what's it afraid of sticking to? They can't see me roll my eyes. <laughs> I think they could hear that. <laughs> that pretty loud eye roll there. <laughs> That's what I say at work all the time. Did I roll my eyes out loud? <laughs> yeah. What you um, got? You ready for the mom joke? Yep. What do we got? Um, so if you buy a bathroom scale one day and a pair of glasses the next day, what are your plans after that? Bathroom scale one day and a pair of glasses the next day. Mm -hmm. What? Wait and see. <laughs> 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 yes. And we have clarification. Uh -huh. What's that? And we have clarification on that plane question. Okay, what's that? It's a closed throat router. Oh, duh. 71. This is a 71. 71 and a half doesn't have this bump on here. Uh, replacement irons? Um, I'm sure there are. Uh, but Veritas has a really good price on new ones. I mean, if you want antiques, the best place to go is um, the parts division on Facebook. It's a group. Um, they, you, you put a post on there saying, hey, I'm looking for this, and you'll find an antique on there. Really good deals, and they all have parts. Um, so that'd be the first place I go when looking for parts. Um, otherwise, you can go down the list of online sellers on handtoolfinder.com, handtoolfinder.com, and that's a collection of every known place I know of in the world to buy hand tools. And most of them have plain parts as well. 
Um, one thing I forgot to mention is when marking this, I want to make sure I put it directly in the middle. And the reason for putting it directly in the middle of the board um, is so that it's the same on both boards. However, as long as I know this is my reference face in this one, this is my reference face in this one, and these are both up, I don't have to put it in the middle. I can put it off center as long as I put it off center the same direction on both, sort, both boards. So one of them will have a thinner half lap than the other. Um, but putting it in the middle is kind of an aesthetic thing. So we've marked all the way around it on the end, the two sides, and then the, the face mark coming up this way. Now we need to do the cutting. Um, I like to start with cutting the cross cut for the shoulder of the joint. Um, whenever you're thinking about a tenon, think about it being a human body. So you have the cheeks and the shoulders. Um, so for this, with the half lap, we just have a shoulder and a cheek. There's nothing on the other side. Um, so I'm going to put it in here, though a lot of people like putting it in a uh, um, bench hook. There's the word. And I'm going to use my sash saw. Nope, oh, nope, that's the tin saw. <laughs> this is one from uh, Jared Green, and I am in love with it, if you haven't known. So let's come on down here. I'm going to pinch the saw, and I'm going to actually put it right on that line so that the side of the tooth is just nicking the, the edge of the line. I'm going to start on the far side, and you see I'm only cutting back here, and I'm going to lower the saw until I'm coming all the way across it. And now I'm established all the way across. I'm going to cut straight down, tipping it slightly back here so I hit this line first, and then I can tip it to the back. A little more. Could put a mirror back there, but I find that kind of confuses me more than not. There's one cheek, then we get to the other cheek. Are they dancing? You know what they say, turn the other cheek. Dancing. Dancing. Dancing cheek oh, to cheek. Oh, cheek to cheek. Hi, God damn you. <laughs> <laughs> you and I went down very different paths. <laughs> Yeah, biblical education gets you. <laughs> Oop, a little more. That first one, I hit the line right on, and I get a really clean edge right here all the way around. On this one, I stayed a hair away from the edge, so I have a little bit of cleanup to do. So I'll show you that when we get there. Next thing we need to do is cut the, the cheek off. And for that, we need a tenon saw. And I'm gonna use this tenon saw. Use my Veritas. Um, why? Because I want to, I have three of them. And this is the one that's the sharpest right now. <laughs> ah, there's the truth. So it's gonna be basically the exact same thing we just did. Uh, we're gonna be starting on, pull this in. Starting on the far side, and then this one I'm going to stay right on that line. Work it until I get it caught in, and then we're going to work the side down and just stay right along the top. I want a kerf running right all. I want a kerf running all the way along the top here. Ooh, bumped over a little bit. Try to work my line back over. When you're working the line, uh, if you find that your first scratch is a little bit off one way or the other, you can lean the saw over and kind of use it like a file to push your line in the direction you want until you get right where you want. Or I could put in a knife wall, do the Paul Sellers thing. I need to raise this up a little bit. Why, and this saw is binding on me, which makes me think my, my cut is actually veering inside the cut. But if ever a saw is binding, add a little bit of wax to it. Not to mention this one actually has a kink up here, as you can see there. So it's not the best saw in the box, but she still works. Okay, so I've cut corner to corner. I've cut on the line I can see, and on the line I can see, so what I'm going to do is turn this around, and now I can cut corner to corner in the other direction, and I can stay on the line I can see. Corner to corner again, level it out. Ooh. Cut it.
about it until. We're just bumping through. And I've got a loose tooth here. So now I'm going to play the game of, I want these to meet. And we like to spend a lot of time making sure this joint, is, this connection between the two saws is perfect. But in reality, you can clean up any schmoo in the corner with a chisel. We're going to do that in a moment. Let's move on to the other one. Because whatever we do in one board, we do to the other one. Any questions? No. Woohoo! We've answered the world's questions. Down to one side, rotate it around. If I really trusted myself, I would just cut all the way down from one side. But I haven't quite gotten there yet. My name isn't Shan Rogers. He's amazing with a good tan cut. Down to depth there. Do one more pass in from the side. Like that. Happiness. So now, theoretically, our joint is all done. And like that, we can call it a day, right? Half lap joint. But uh, yeah, there's a little bit of a bump here still. And a little bit of a bump here. And they don't quite go all the way in. A little bit of a gap there. So let's do some cleanup on this and make it pretty. So for that, a lot of people like to jump into a shoulder plane. And what's a shoulder plane for? Well, it's for doing the shoulder. Um, you could use a rabbit plane, though a rabbit plane tends to have a higher angle and can cause problems. So I'm going to show it with the shoulder plane, which is what um, some people think of first. And I'll show it with a chisel as well. So let's set the camera up on here. The shoulder plane is Really nice if it's set up well, though a shoulder plane is surprisingly expensive for what it is. Come on, focus on me. There you go. So for this one, I'm just going to put it on here. Ooh, you're taking a big bite. Back it off a little bit. Come on. Do we need to sharpen? Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one's dull, um, so yeah, we're not gonna be doing. One of the problems with the uh, with shoulder work is you're cutting cross grain. Anytime you're cutting cross grain, it's got to be crazy, ch crazy sharp. Um, so we're not gonna do that. We're going to do instead. Nor would you use that this. particular technique, would you? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't generally use the shoulder plane to do shoulders because I much prefer using a chisel. I find it to be faster, more efficient, just plain simple. I just meant body mechanics. What's that? The well, yeah, okay, so I'm doing it this way to hold it flat so I can show it with the camera better. Usually I'd have it up front and vertical so I could put my body weight on top of it, register it flat against the side, and then come in this way. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now. For the chisel, though, this one I do like to have it flat. Lift it up, move it out. And... Bring that one down there. So for this one, I'm going to put it right into that line on the top because I don't have much to take off and wiggle it down. Wiggle it down. And this one you can undercut a little bit because no one's ever going to see it. I'm just going to move it over half the thickness of the chisel. Move it over again half the thickness of the chisel. Just at a tiny little ridge here, trying to balance on. And then at this point, I'm basically right on the line here. So I'm just going to start it in a little ways, undercut a little bit. That should be good on that one. That's good on that one. So there's our shoulder. Now this face, 
needs a little bit of work. One of the tricks is you can use the side of the, the, the chisel here, and I can see I'm tipping side to side. So I've got a belly in the middle to remove. I could come in with the shoulder plane and do that as well, or I could create a bit of a shoulder, a bit of a ridge back here at the back, and then I could come in with a regular plane. And so this is the, the poor man's cheap way of doing it. So let me grab this one. So with this I can come in, because I did this ridge back here, I have space for the cheek of the plane to come in. And I'm trying not to blow out the back side, I'm trying to just to go from here to here, but only hit that middle high spot. Flip around, like that. And then I can come in with this again, and now I can see and I'm flat all the way across. Also, another way of doing it is I could come under the router plane. Set this up to my marking gauge line. Right there. Need more. And I can put down pressure here and work it across a little more. In this case, I'm actually pretty close to where I want to be. Just a little bit out here. And I'm holding constant down pressure on this knob. But I think that one is right about where I want to be. And I can use the chisel to check diagonals. Oop, I'm riding up on the, the edge of this. You can move it back and forth and see how good we are. I think that one's actually pretty darn good. So we can see that one needs more work. What's the next question? Evan. <clears throat> Mm, sorry. Evan Van Dyke wants to know, can you show splitting off the second cheek? Um, well, no, we already went past that. Um, usually, oh. I don't like splitting off cheek, and it wouldn't work with this board, um, because this is curly white oak. Curly. Um, so that means the grain is going like this. Um, you can't split off of that. And I, I generally don't like splitting off because I rarely work with straight grain wood. I like working with crazy difficult stuff, um, and because of that, it, splitting doesn't work. Uh, but if you do have really nice straight grain splitting work, the idea is rather than doing uh, cutting with the cheek, you come into the chisel halfway back and you chop it and you split off a piece. And then you move halfway back to the line again and you chop it off and it splits off a piece. And at that point you start to see, you know, is your grain perfectly straight or is it leaning in a little bit? Is it leaning out a little bit? And you know how far back you can go before, mm, maybe I should bring in the plane and just do the final cleanup. And if it's really nice and straight, then you can just do the last couple shavings with the chisel and, and get it nice and clean. Um, but rarely do I have wood that that works with. Because I am a masochist. Just ask my wife. So if you like working with curly wood, does that make you mower Larry? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to comment on why I would marry you. Um... Because it's the smart choice. I don't know why there's a question. All right, so chisel them down. A <laughs> he bit doesn't back. answer that one. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> Making sure my cheek, because this is the one I was really close to the line with, so I'm just undercutting a little bit. And this one, the cheek is really nice and short and tight. So if I put this in here up against it, I should have a nice flush edge here, which I do. And this one up against there, should have a nice flush, flush edge back here. That is very pleasing. I am very very happy with how smooth that is. Unfortunately, I still have a ledge right here, um, and so that's what we're working with. I need to move this down a little bit because this is up high. If I put my chisel on here, yeah, this one's got a big bow in the middle. I need Can to take you off more material. Read? You know, tip it down a little bit? Yeah, thank you. There we go. Now, I did actually make a router designed for doing tenons, and the router is all the way out here. The rest of the body's back here. This gives me a lot more reference surface so that I can very easily adjust things down. 
a little more, and lock it back in place. And with this, I can now come in and get exactly what I'm looking for. It's really, really close. Let's see how close that gets me. Because I just took off material here where it was, where it was high. And in that case, I've got a nice flat bed. It's not rocking at all. It's not moving at all. But it's just a little bit high here. And it's the same thing on the other side. This needs to go down a little farther. So I need to take off material on this whole face. And what I could do is take off half the material on this face and half the material on this face. Or I could just move this face down to make the match, which is what we're going to do. The nice thing with the router plane is I could Loosen these up, move it down one notch, tighten it back up. Actually, I need a little more than that. That's just barely scratching the surface. Make sure I'm going the right direction. Down just a little bit. Or I can just do right back at the shoulder. And then, here. because I've just done this space at the shoulder, could come into the plane, take off. Ooh, don't go all the way through, James. Just a couple shavings that way. Turn around. Take a couple shavings off the other side. I've taken off material all the way across. Put a little burr right there. I can put that in there. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's pleasing. Now, one of the things I'm noticing is, I don't know if the camera will catch it up, but there's an ever so slight gap there. Just not quite going all the way back that way. And I'm trying to see what is stopping it. See how it is on this side. Yeah, this side's really nice and tight. I like that side. But this side just needs to go back a little bit more. And I think I just need to undercut this edge. So to do that, I can bring this chisel in, and I can put it on the side, and I can see. Oh yeah, I do have a little lip at the bottom here. There's just some schmoo right in the corner I need to clean out. And it's a lot of just fiddly dinking back and forth until you get what you want. So I'm just going to use this to run right into that corner. And one of the things with this joinery window is I am taking my time and doing really, really clean work because this is a chance to test my skills. If I'm making joinery, I don't really care because no one's ever going to see that. Ah, oh, see, that's what I'm looking for. That's a nice, tight, flat joint. I like that. So there's a half lap joint, the first of six. Um, next week, we're going to be doing the miter joint, excuse me, the bridle joint. Um, the bridle joint is basically two half laps put together. Um, so it's a mortise and tenon. It still has the same problem if it can come out this way or this way. Um, but um, because it's housed, it tends to hold better, it glues better, and it's a little bit stronger. It can't come out in this dimension. So that'll be next week's fun. What questions we got? We got done early because this is a simple joint. Um, Warren Munn asked, how would you go using a rasp or file for the Ooh. shaping or flattening? Very good question. Um, so if anyone has questions, throw them in the chat. We can turn the rest of this into a bit of a Q&A. Let me grab, um, how much I have to take off really determines what I'm going to be grabbing. Um, I wouldn't use a rasp unless I have a lot to take off. Um, what I generally like is a curved tooth file or, where are you? Missing, always missing, there you are. Um, or a relatively coarse rasp, which needs to be cleaned out. I was doing some aluminum with it and aluminum likes to clog them up. Card file, cleans them out nicely. Um, I like using a curved tooth uh, file. It just, it smooths out very, very nicely. Gives you a really, really clean surface very, very easily. And these are relatively affordable. Um, for some of you may be in the auto body world um, 
and have come across a file holder um, or a lead smoother, or it goes by a whole bunch of different names. Um, in the woodworking world, it's called a file holder. And all it usually is is a curved tooth file, but on a body. So it works just like a plane. And I can use this to clean out the surface. And I can even use this to do a little bit of shoulder work. Um, I love using the file holder. Um, I did a video on it a while ago. I haven't done one in a long time. I should probably do that. Um, but until I got a shoulder plane, this was what I used. And honestly, still, most of the time I think I use this more than I do my shoulder plane because this is a little more refined. It takes off a little less material and gives you a very, very clean surface. Um, whereas the, the shoulder plane, it's always got to be sharpened. It's always got to be set up. This, you just grab and go. It's kind of like a, a no brain, no, no think. Um, if you do have files, um, something with a medium grit. I wouldn't want something really fine, otherwise you'd be taking forever. But just like that. You usually have one hand back here. I'll bring a finger up onto the file. Um, and then another one over in here. And just like that. Now the question is, did I take it out of true? I did. I moved it down a little bit. Oh well. Created just a little bit of a ledge there. Oh well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, a file holder is an amazing tool for this type of thing. What else we got? Um, more of a funny joke. <laughs> I like six that. wants to know, is having eight braces too many? Why? Why what? Oh, I thought there was a punchline. No, that's the question. Oh, oh, is it having eight braces too many? No, I've got... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. Um, oh, eight. So I've got eight right here on my wall. And then I've got another half dozen down there. <laughs> braces are one of those things that just kind of tend to follow you home. Um, every time you buy a box lot of something, there's a brace in there. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, I have three sizes that I use um, quite regularly. I have this one, which is a six inch swing. Um, so it's three inches either side, three inch radius, six inch swing. Um, then I have <clears throat> the 12 inch swing, and I use this one. Uh, this is probably the most common one that I use. But when I really want to get onto it, this one gives me a ton of leverage. Uh, this one is an 18 inch swing, 18 inches from side to side, nine inches out. Um, and this has an incredible amount of torque. I can, I can really, really crank down on things. I can put probably somewhere around 100 foot-pounds of pressure on it. Um, to give you an idea, that's about the amount of pressure you need to um, tighten a lug bolt on a car. Um, actually, it wouldn't surprise me if I can get a little more than that. It's a, it's a, yeah. This will give you way more torque than any drill will, any hand drill, electric drill. Um, but yeah, I use that for the big bits. What's next? I just had a silly thought pop in my head. Well, that's normal. <laughs> I was... The way you said twer torque, it kind of sounded like twerk, and I was like, the tool's giving you way more twerk than a drill. Well, you know, <laughs> trying to uh, trying to reach out to the younger crowd now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell uh, me that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here to give you all the short material you want. Yes, <laughs> pun intended. What's next? Uh, that's all I got. Cool. Well, I think we'll wrap it up then. Uh, next week, we will be doing the bridal joint. Um, we'll be going through these. Well, actually, yeah, next week, we'll be doing the bridal joint. Um, and uh, we have a, a few other things because we'll have uh, the normal Q&A on the week after that. Then the week after that we actually have an interview. Um, I don't know if any of you watch shorts on YouTube. You may have come across a weird looking Irish dude um, who talks funny and does really cool woodworking. Um, so we're going to be having Ethan on. Not Ethan. Oh, come on. Lost his name. It's an E. Oh. Someone post in the comments. But yeah, he's going to be coming on for a, uh, a hangout. So, yeah. Um, cool. And I think on that note, we'll wrap it up. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.